how to decrease the risk of heart inflammation from mRNA vaccines. To create this presentation, I have used 75 references, 67 published articles, and eight medical books. We cannot show you here the contents of all those references, but surely we will review quickly some of them through this presentation. And you can find the complete list of references at the end of this presentation and also in the description of this video. Myocarditis. This book, Brownwald's Heart Disease Edition 11, is the most famous and the most valid textbook in cardiovascular medicine. Based on this book, page 4009, myocarditis is inflammation of the heart muscle occurring as a result of exposure to either discrete external antigens, such as viruses, bacteria, parasites, toxins, or drugs, or internal triggers, such as autoimmune activation against self-antigens. Based on this book, myocarditis is responsible for sudden cardiovascular death in approximately 2% of infants, 5% of children, and 5 to 14 percent of young athletes. Most case series show a male predominance which may be mediated by sex hormones. Based on this textbook, in, in most cases myocarditis is triggered by an inciting event such as infection, which most of the time is a viral infection, or exposure to a drug or toxin that activates the immune response. According to this textbook, myocarditis typically has a bimodal distribution in terms of age. In young children and teenagers, it shows itself with acute or fulminant presentation, but in older adults, the presenting symptoms are more subtle and insidious, often with DCM, dilated cardiomyopathy, and heart failure. What are the clinical presentations of myocarditis? Based on this textbook, classically patients with myocarditis present with non-specific symptoms related to the heart. Fatigue, 82%, shortness of breath, 81%, arrhythmias, 55%, palpitations, 49%, and chest pain addressed, 26%. What is the prognosis of myocarditis? Based on this textbook, approximately 15% of patients with myopericarditis may develop recurrent myopericarditis. In children, the time course of left ventricular functional recovery extends to at least 8 years, and the overall risk of death or requirement for transplantation approaches 30%. Also, there is a risk of late heart failure, which is usually due to diastolic dysfunction years after the apparent resolution of acute myocarditis. According to an article published in the European Heart Journal on June 14, 2015, and you can see the link over there, myocarditis is a major cause of sudden death in young adults. Even if the initial presentation suggests a mild course of disease, progression to heart failure frequently occurs. Myocarditis and mRNA vaccines. After starting vaccinating people against COVID-19 with mRNA vaccines, first they were spotted cases of myocarditis. Then as vaccination continued, the number of cases started rising. Up to this moment, we do not know exactly the incidence and prevalence of myocarditis from mRNA vaccines. Actually, mRNA vaccination is not the only one that has caused myocarditis in history of medicine. When you review medical literature, you can find definitely there that vaccination against smallpox also caused subclinical myocarditis. 2000 868 cases per 100,000 subjects. This is why some experts believe that vaccine-induced immune-mediated myocarditis might be the right term to use. Let's in here review a few articles.
This is CDC website, myocarditis and pericarditis after mRNA COVID-19 vaccination, updated on November 12, 2021. As you can see, they are published in here a very brief information about myocarditis after mRNA vaccination. This is another article published in Circulation Observational Findings of Pulse Cardiac Test Findings for Inflammatory Markers in Patients Receiving mRNA Vaccines. This is a fact sheet published by the Australian government. Basically, this fact sheet is about new item for cardiac MRI to diagnose myocarditis associated with mRNA vaccination when conventional imaging and other tests fail. Another article published in PubMed, myocarditis induced sudden death after mRNA vaccination in Korea. This is a case report. Another article, symptomatic acute myocarditis in seven adolescents after Pfizer COVID-19 vaccination. And this is from WebMed, evidence ties COVID vaccines to heart issue in youth. How mRNA vaccine induced myocarditis occurs? Inflammation is a very complex process and definitely we cannot explain the details of pathophysiological mechanisms in here, and I have done my best to make it as simple as possible for better understanding. The inflammatory response is characterized by four components. Let's see what those four components are. Four components of inflammatory response are the inducers of inflammation, the sensors that recognize inflammation, the mediators of inflammation, and definitely we will have the target tissue. Let's see what these four components are in myocarditis from mRNA vaccines. In myocarditis from mRNA vaccines, the target tissue is the heart. The inducers of inflammation are spike protein, which your body makes it, and lipid nanoparticles, which are already in the vaccines, the sensors that recognize inflammation are two famous proteins. They are called toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors. I'm going to talk more about them later. And the mediators of inflammation are pro-inflammatory chemokines, cytokines, and prostaglandins. There are two interesting proteins also involved in myocarditis. One of them is called, as you can see here, CCR2, I'm going to talk more about it later, and the other one is called SOCS1. SOCS1 stands for suppressor of cytokine signaling 1. We know for sure in medicine that this protein, SOCS1, plays an important role in myocarditis from viruses, but whether this protein plays a role in vaccine-induced myocarditis, we don't know yet. When someone develops myocarditis, the heart will go through healing and remodeling phases, which can leave behind fibrosis to some extent. As I said in previous slide, the inducers of inflammation in mRNA-induced myocarditis are spike protein and lipid nanoparticles, both. I am going to show you a few studies and publish articles that confirm and support the notion that these two are the main culprits when it comes to inflammation of the heart. Here is the first article which has been published in the PubMed. The spike protein of sars coronavirus 2 induces endothelial inflammation through integrin alpha-5, beta-1, and NF-kappa B signaling. Endothelium basically is the inner lining of the heart and blood vessels. This article is a new one and has been published on February 7, 2022. The second article has been published in the circulation research on March 31st, 2021. SARS coronavirus spike protein impairs endothelial function via down regulation of ACE2. Article number three, which has been published in the eye science, the mRNA LMP platform's lipid nanoparticle component used in preclinical vaccine studies is highly inflammatory. This article has been published on 
November 19, 2021, and I'm going to read the highlights for you. Lipid nanoparticles used for preclinical studies are highly inflammatory. The lipid nanoparticles activate multiple inflammatory pathways and induce interleukin 1 beta and interleukin 6. The lipid nanoparticles' inflammatory properties stems from their ionizable lipid component, and the lipid nanoparticles could be responsible for adjuvanticity and some of the side effects. And another article which has been published in the PubMed, Development and Evaluation of Lipid Nanoparticles for Drug Delivery, a Study of Toxicity in Vitro and in Vivo. This article, which has been published about six years ago in February 2016, discusses that lipid nanoparticles can induce inflammation and decrease antioxidant defenses of the body. Now, how can we decrease the risk of heart inflammation from mRNA vaccines? You have seen this slide before, we discussed about it. To decrease the risk of heart inflammation and also help someone with myocarditis, we can interfere in three areas. Area one, through the mediators of inflammation, area two, through the sensors, and area three, during healing and modeling phases, basically trying to decrease the risk of cardiac fibrosis, which can decrease the risk of heart failure in the future. In area one, the most important factor involved is CCR2. CCR2 is a protein. This protein has been at the center of many research in medicine for a long time. In people with myocarditis, CCR2 will be upregulated. It will be overexpressed. And if we can silence and downregulate CCR2, we can surely decrease the risk of myocarditis. Silencing CCR2. CCR2 is a protein in humans. It is crucial for the migration of monocytes and infiltration of macrophages in the heart. This slide shows that CCR2 mediates the migration of monocytes from the blood circulation to the heart, and then monocytes in the heart will convert to M1 macrophages through the help of uh, Th1 cells. Then M1 macrophages will release uh, pro-inflammatory cytokines. This slide is from a published article that shows CCR2 cells accumulate in the heart in patients with acute myocarditis. In section A, you can see the stained samples from both control group and people with myocarditis. Those uh, brownish uh, black dots are CCR2 cells. As you can see that in people with myocarditis, we have many CCR2 cells in the heart. Section B shows the number of CCR2 cells per square millimeter of heart tissue. And again, in here, you can see that the number of CCR2 cells in people with myocarditis is very high. And section C is the result of PCR analysis in heart biopsies from both groups. And again, in here, you can see that the number of CCR2 cells are very high in people with myocarditis. Let me show you a few published articles that discuss how silencing CCR2 can help with myocarditis. This article has been published in the European Heart Journal a very long time ago in 2015, silencing of CCR2 in myocarditis. Basically, this article discusses that how silencing CCR2 has a therapeutic value in the treatment of myocarditis. The second article has been published in Circulation Research in 2018. In this article, they discuss the importance of CCR2 in myocardial injury. And article number three, which has been published in Circulation in 2018, in this article, they discuss that how siRNA, siRNA stands for a small interferon RNA, can improve autoimmune myocarditis. But other than siRNA against CCR2, what else can silence CCR2? I am sure you will be surprised to hear this. It is vitamin D. You heard it right. 
Vitamin D downregulates CCR2, decreasing the recruitment of monocytes and macrophages in the heart, followed by lowering the risk of heart inflammation after mRNA vaccination. Basically, vitamin D can silence CCR2, which will lead to a decrease in migration of monocytes to the heart. This article has been published in the PubMed a very long time ago in 2014, effect of vitamin D on monocyte chemoattractant protein 1, which is famous in medicine as MCP1 production in monocyte and macrophages. Actually, CCR2 is the primary receptor of MCP1. The second article has been published in the Journal of Steroid Biochemistry and Molecular Biology in 2014. This article discusses that vitamin D suppresses macrophage adhesion and migration by down regulation of ER stress and scavenger receptor A1 in type 2 diabetes. This article concludes that vitamin D can decrease adhesion marker beta-1, beta-2 integrin expression, and CCR2 expression. Down-regulating toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors. This is the area number two that we are going to interfere to decrease the risk of heart inflammation. Toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors are specialized groups of protein that play a vital role in the innate immune system. Activation of toll-like receptors is among the most common and earliest innate immune responses. And so far in humans, they have identified 11 types of toll-like receptors. In this famous medical textbook, Brown Walls Heart Disease, edition 11, on page 1104, you can read, the primary role of these molecules, toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors, is to initiate repair of the injured myocardium. However, when they are expressed for protracted periods or at high levels, they provoke deleterious changes in cardiac myocytes and non-myocytes, as well as changes in the myocardial extracellular matrix. Also in the same textbook on page 4029, you can read multiple toll-like receptors TLR2, TLR3, TLR4, TLR7, and TLR9 have been implicated in inflammatory heart disease and myocarditis. This slide shows which subtypes of toll-like receptors and nod-like receptors are involved in heart inflammation. As you can see in this slide, there is a subtype of nod-like receptors. It is called NOD2. NOD2 plays a role in viral myocarditis. TLR2 plays a role in autoimmunity, myocarditis, and response to vaccines, and TLR4 plays a role in myocarditis, heart failure, high blood pressure, autoimmune disorders, inflammatory bowel diseases, and allergies. Since both TLR2 and TLR4 play a role in autoimmunity and myocarditis, if we can decrease their activities, if we can downregulate them, definitely we can decrease the risk of heart inflammation. How can we downregulate TLR2 and TLR4? I'm sure you will be surprised yet again. It is vitamin D again. You heard me correctly. Vitamin D can downregulate and decrease the activities of both TLR2 and TLR4. In this medical textbook, Vitamin D, edition 4, volume 2, page 895, you can read treatment of human monocytes with vitamin D suppressed the expression of the TLR2, TLR4, and TLR9. Let's review a few published articles here. Article number one, why vitamin D deficiency impacts on expression of toll-like receptor 2 and cytokine profile, a pilot study. This article has been published in the Journal of Translational Medicine in 2013. Article number two, why vitamin D and toll-like receptors. This article has been published in the Science Direct in 2018. This article discusses the role of vitamin D in decreasing the expression of TLR2. Article number three. 
the emerging role of toll-like receptor 4 in myocardial inflammation. This article has been published in Nature's.com in 2016. Article number 4, Toll-like receptors and myocardial inflammation. This article has been published in the PubMed in 2011. And finally, article number 5, which has been published in Circulation in 2017. This article discusses the role of NOD2 in viral myocarditis. So, based on what we have discussed so far, vitamin D deficiency can increase the risk of developing myocarditis. And optimizing your vitamin D level, keeping your vitamin D level above 50 nanogram per ml or 125 nanomol per liter can decrease the risk of mRNA vaccine induced myocarditis. Attenuating cardiac fibrosis. This is the area number three that we can interfere to help someone with myocarditis. One of the major concerns in myocarditis is the risk of developing heart failure years after the apparent resolution of myocarditis. When someone develops heart inflammation, the heart will go through healing and remodeling phases, which can leave behind some cardiac fibrosis. And unfortunately, cardiac fibrosis can progress to heart failure in the future. If we interfere in here in healing and remodeling phases and try to decrease the risk of cardiac fibrosis, definitely we can minimize the risk of developing heart failure in the future. Is this possible? Yes, it is possible through a process in medicine which is called EMT. EMT stands for epithelial mesenchymal transition. EMT is a biological process. It is an essential event in wound healing, tissue regeneration, organ development, and progression of cancers. As you can see on the slides, we have three types of uh, EMT, type 1, type 2, and type 3. When someone develops myocarditis, the heart will go through EMT type 2. Basically, some epithelial cells will gain the functions and phenotypes of mesenchymal cells, which will leave some fibrosis behind. So, if we interfere in here, definitely we can minimize the risk of developing fibrosis and heart failure in the future. You remember this slide, and I showed you that vitamin D can decrease the risk of developing myocarditis from mRNA vaccines by silencing CCR2 and downregulating the sensors that recognize inflammation, especially toll-like receptors. What if I tell you that there is a unique substance and natural medicine that not only can decrease inflammation, but also can decrease and attenuate cardiac fibrosis? What is that natural substance? It is called thymokinone. Thymokinone is the main active ingredient of the plant Nigella sativa, which is commonly known as black seed or black cumin. Thymokinone is a potent cardioprotective agent and protects against the drug-induced cardiotoxicity. When you review medical literature, there are over 1,400 research articles potentially related to the effect of thymokinone on tissue and organ fibrosis. This slide is from a published article in the PubMed, The Potential Rule of Thymokinone Implementing the Cardiovascular Complications of COVID-19. The article has been published on July 23, 2021. This slide discusses the positive impacts of thymokinone on people with covid 19. This is the sum up of protective effects of thymokinone against myocarditis. As you can see on the slide, thymokinone protects the heart by three different mechanisms, decreasing inflammation, decreasing myocardial oxidative stress, and decreasing cardiac fibrosis. In terms of inflammation, thymokinone decreases interferons, interleukins, TNF-alpha, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes. And thymokinone down-regulates 
NF kappa beta and jack stat signaling pathway and also thymokinone is going to increase the activity and enzyme which is famous as SIRT1. In terms of myocardial oxidative stress, thymokinone increases the activity of three enzymes, superoxide dismutase, catalase, and glutathione peroxidase. Actually, these three enzymes are the first line of antioxidative defense of the body. When those three enzymes are active, they're going to scavenge the three famous, uh, as you can see here, free radicals, superoxide, hydroxyl, and hydrogen peroxides, which is going to definitely lead to decreased myocardial oxidative stress. And, and we showed you that thymokinone regulates EMT type 2, which is going to decrease the risk of cardiac fibrosis. Let me show you a few articles here about thymokinone. Article number one, the potential rule of thymokinone in preventing the cardiovascular complications of COVID-19, published in the PubMed in December 2021. The second article, thymokinone in autoimmune diseases, therapeutic potential and molecular mechanisms, published in February 2021. Article number three. Effect of nigella sativa and its bioactive compound on type 2 epithelial to mesenchymal transition is systematic review, published in October 2019. Article number 4. Immunomodulatory and anti-inflammatory action of nigella sativa and thymokinone, a comprehensive review, published in the PubMed in 2015. Article number 5. Thymokinone and its Pharmacological Perspective, a review published in December 2021. And article number six, Thymokinone, an emerging natural drug with a wide range of medical applications, published in the PubMed in 2014. Here are the risk factors for developing myocarditis from mRNA vaccines. Age, it is mostly common in youngsters. Gender, we see mostly in male, and definitely vitamin D deficiency. How much vitamin D is needed to treat deficiency? Under one year old, 2,000 IU per day, 1 to 18 years old, 4,000 IU per day, 19 years old and older, up to 10,000 IU per day. Actually, you can take 10,000 to 15,000 IU per day, and it is totally safe. We have published a video already about vitamin D toxicity, and you can find that video in the CSSN channel on YouTube. In terms of thymokinone, the recommended dose is usually half to one milligram per kg per day. About thymokinone products in the market, usually they come in different formulations, and I'm giving you two examples here. Example one. Black cumin seed extract 500 milligrams, 3% thymokinone. This product is going to provide you 500 times 3%. You're going to get 50 milligrams thymokinone purple. The second example would be black cumin seed extract 250 milligrams, 5% thymokinone. This product is going to provide you 12.5 milligrams thymokinone purple. Here are my final words. Whether you have had any of the mRNA vaccines or you are planning to have any of them, just load up on vitamin D and thymokinone to minimize their adverse effects on the heart and other organs. I really hope that you learned something interesting today because we make science easy to understand. Now you know. If you don't want to miss our next videos, you can subscribe to the CSSN channel on YouTube. To support us, you can share, like, or comment on this video. Until next time, stay safe, stay connected.